People with MS often need a lot of diagnostic medical tests, MRI scans, blood tests, maybe even a spinal tap, but increasingly in modern times I've seen people with MS be subjected to excessive, unnecessary diagnostic tests, and I know some people will disagree with this or even find it offensive, but I can tell you from my clinical experience I'm very confident that excessive testing is unhelpful and can even be quite harmful. I'll explain more at the end of the video, but without further ado, I give Give you eight pointless tests for people with multiple sclerosis. Number one, Epstein-Barr virus serology. It's well known that EBV, the virus which causes mononucleosis or glandular fever, the kissing disease that makes you sleepy, is associated with MS. People with a history of mono have double the risk of MS, and this study showed that people with antibodies against the virus have a 30-fold higher risk than people who don't have antibodies. However, the test is still pointless because almost everyone in the general population tests positive whether they have MS or not, approximately. 95% of adults and virtually 100% of people with a diagnosis of MS. I believe every single patient of mine in my entire career who has had this test has tested positive. And even if you test negative, what do you want me to do with that information? I'm not going to give you a different prognosis, different dietary advice, a different medication. It's just useless information. The one exception is if you're going to enter the clinical trial for ATA-188, an immunotherapy directed against Epstein-Barr virus, it's part of the inclusion criteria, so you need the blood test. Number two, neurofilament light chain. This so-called biomarker of MS is really just a general breakdown product of the central nervous system and can be elevated in numerous neurological diseases, including MS, stroke, and traumatic brain injury. It's true that higher levels are correlated with relapses and worsening disability, but the correlation is very weak. Take a look at this graph showing the levels in people who are healthy controls, people without MS, people with relapsing MS, and then progressive MS, sure there's some correlation, but a lot of overlap between groups. So it means something for groups of individuals, but for an individual, there's just too much variability. Take a look at this graph showing an association between the EDSS, Expanded Disability Status Scale, a measure of disability in MS, and neurofilament light chain. It's all over the place. If anyone tries to tell you they can predict your disability or prognosis with this blood test, they absolutely cannot predict anything, nor is it practical to use this blood test to make any clinical decision. So there's no point for you to have it outside of doing research studies on larger groups of people. Number three, vitamin D levels. Ooh, I'm so guilty of ordering so many vitamin D levels in so many people with MS, but I have to say it's not really evidence-based. Sure, there's a link between MS and lower levels of vitamin D, and lower levels of vitamin D are associated with worse prognosis. For example, example, this study showed that people with lower levels of vitamin D tend to make more new lesions, and it's associated with clinical outcomes as well. But does actually taking vitamin D do anything? According to numerous studies, the answer is actually no. For example, this graph shows five randomized trials from Cochrane's evidence-based reviews showing no benefit to vitamin D supplementation, and other studies show the exact same result. My personal opinion, it's likely other factors confounded with vitamin D, such as sunlight exposure, that are probably driving the association. Can you take vitamin D just in case? Of course, it's very safe at reasonable levels. If you're taking very high doses, like the Coimbra protocol, should you do vitamin D level parathyroid hormone calcium for safety purposes? Sure, that's practical. Can you check vitamin D level once? Of course you could, but checking it frequently, titrating your dose of vitamin D to achieve a specific result, it's definitely not evidence-based and unlikely to help you. Number four, a CAT scan of the head. I've had a lot of patients with MS go to the emergency room with worsening symptoms, perhaps from an MS relapse or a pseudo-exacerbation due to something else such as infection. But either way, they're often subjected to a CAT scan of the head by the emergency department, which is almost certainly a 
pointless test because it's not very good at revealing multiple sclerosis plaques at all and difficult to discriminate from other pathologies. So unless a different diagnosis like stroke or brain hemorrhage is actually suspected, just skip the CAT scan and if imaging is necessary, go straight to the MRI. Number five, electromyogram nerve conduction study or EMGNCS. This electrophysiologic test can be very useful in diagnosing many peripheral nervous system disorders such as carpal tunnel syndrome or radiculopathy, i.e. a pinched nerve. But in multiple sclerosis, it's expected to be normal. And I've had many patients who are diagnosed with something else based on a positive result, like an incident carpal tunnel syndrome that had nothing to do with the symptoms. It's very important for doctors to listen to patients carefully in terms of the details of their symptoms and do a proper exam to at least determine if a disease is of central or peripheral nervous system origin. Of course, no doctor can diagnose every patient instantly every time, but hopefully we can order more appropriate tests that really reflect the patient's symptoms and exam. Number six, brainstem auditory evoked response and somatosensory evoked potentials. These electrophysiologic tests can detect subtle, often chronic injury to the spinal cord and brainstem. And prior to the introduction of MRI scans in the 1980s, they were helpful in the diagnosis of MS, which frankly was very difficult back then. I'll give respect to our forefathers. However, this has been supplanted by MRI scans, which is a far superior and more accurate technology. And these older tests should no longer be ordered for the diagnosis of MS, in my opinion. And frankly, visual evoked potentials are also usually unnecessary for people with MS. Number seven, anti-MOG and anti acroporin 4 These blood tests for antibodies are helpful for the diagnosis of rare autoimmune diseases of the nervous system, myelin oligodendrocyte glycoprotein-associated disease, and neuromyelitis optica, which can sometimes mimic MS. And of course, it is sometimes necessary to do these blood tests. However, I've noticed the ridiculous trend of people doing these blood tests in every single patient with multiple sclerosis. Look, if you have typical symptoms and exam findings of MS and your MRI scans look like this, you don't have those other diseases. You don't have to do a blood test for every possible disease. Just keep the blood in your veins. Number eight, ocular computed tomography. OCT can be very helpful in clarifying the diagnosis of optic neuritis and ruling out other conditions. And hey, I'm a neurologist. I appreciate the input from an ophthalmologist, especially if the initial symptoms are visual to clarify the diagnosis and make sure I'm not making a mistake. However, OCT has been promoted by some as a monitoring test for MS. And it is true that retinal thinning has been associated with worse visual function and even overall disability. But the correlation is not strong and I would not give a different recommendation based on the result of a monitoring test in a stable patient. And so I would not recommend this test for monitoring purposes. So those are eight tests I think are generally unnecessary in people with MS. Of course, everyone's situation is different and there are exceptions that I can't cover here for brevity. So please talk to your own provider for medical advice. I think in general, there's a very strong psychological bias to believe that doing more, more testing, more thoroughness leads to better medical care, but that's not always the case. And sometimes careful listening and good judgment is more valuable than a hundred diagnostic tests. Also, from the perspective of the physician, it's very difficult to deal with a lot of data in the medical record. Someone's medical record, if they're a little bit older, have a long history of chronic conditions, could easily be 2,000 pages, progress notes, hospital admissions, blood tests, radiologic studies. I can't look at all of them. I have to pick and choose what I think is most important. And if I'm looking at 100 pointless tests, I could easily miss something simple, like a complete blood count, can consistent with iron deficiency anemia that's easily treated with dietary modification or supplements and will actually make you feel better rather than something that's obscure, esoteric, and not actionable. 
Also, my experience is that tests don't really provide meaningful long-term reassurance. Sometimes we're just training people that they need a test in order to get that reassurance. Sometimes we just need good judgment and pragmatism. Also, a lot of tests lead to abnormalities which may or may not be significant and can create a lot of unnecessary anxiety or even further unnecessary tests or interventions. I'll tell you one story. I had a patient who once had a colonoscopy for no clear indication. He didn't need the test. I don't exactly remember the details. During that colonoscopy, the person doing the test noticed something in the terminal ileum, the end of the small intestines, and they did a biopsy, which was consistent with Crohn's disease. This person had no gastrointestinal symptoms whatsoever. However, the gastroenterologist convinced them that they had Crohn's disease, I'm not sure if they actually did or not, and started them on a medication which was a TNF-alpha blocker, and as a rare complication of this medication, they developed multiple sclerosis, and then they were seeing me. And you can see how you can go down this chain of events and get further complications. So my general opinion is it's better to stick to limited diagnostic tests that are necessary and make a specific effort to avoid excessive or unnecessary tests. And the key thing is, will this test lead to information that will allow better treatment prognosis or information. I'd be interested to know your results. Certainly you can disagree with the individual items I mentioned here, or do you think there are other unnecessary diagnostic tests for people with MS that I didn't mention? And let me know if you have ideas for other videos.